hear a squawk on this episode of The Pine Talk. Ezra and Peter will share their stock of information to keep you up to date around the clock. Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Pine Talk, the podcast for the Pine64 community by members of the Pine64 community. I'm Peter, blogger and chief at Linbop.net. And I am Ezra, internet content creator and software enthusiast. In this episode, we are talking to Dalton Durst, development manager of the UbiPorts project. Go over some community news and answer a few of your questions and go into your feedback. But first, what have you been up to lately? So Ezra, tell me, what have you been up to lately? I have been working on some PinePhone-related content. Currently, a jump drive tutorial. You can find me, uh, I'm Electronion on YouTube and on Odyssey. And I'm also working on a selfish website, a home for all my stuff. I'm also working on a little side project called User Games, a place to learn about video game development from art to code. So if you know anybody who would be interested, or if you're interested yourself, feel free to check it out. It's free, and it fills me with glee. What about you, Peter? I'm working on my app list, which you can find at linmobapps.frama.io. Don't worry, it's linked in the show notes, so you won't have to look that up. And maybe you know it already. It's a list of uh, software that works on mobile new Linux f- operating systems that are not uh, selfish OS or Ubuntu Touch, so that don't have that kind of a curated app store and i'm trying to track all the interesting projects so if you know some that aren't on there please get in touch for now don't expect too much i'm just adding a few apps so as that aside i'm currently looking for another static site generator because i'm not too happy with jackal which i use for my blog at linmob.net recommendations are welcome and now let's go to the interview so it's the second episode of Pine Talk, and we've got our first guest, and it's Dalton Durst, the development manager of the UbiPorts project, which picked up Ubuntu Touch when Canonical decided to drop it. Howdy, howdy. So, hi there, Dalton. Uh, how are you? How's life? Oh, as good as it can be in uh, post-2020, 2021 world. <laughs> Pretty well. So let's continue with one more kind of personal question first to somehow get to know you. Oh, when did you get started with computing? When did I get started with computing? Oh boy. Um so right now actually it's across the room from me. I I know exactly where it is. There is a Gateway 2000 computer uh <laughs> that uh by the time I was old enough to use it was running Windows 98. I think it shipped with 95, but I can't verify that. Um, and I got started playing uh, Bob the Builder and Freddy Fish on that computer um, and nice. trying to install and uninstall things because it had a like two gigabyte hard drive that was always full for some reason. Um so, you know, I'd have to go into add and remove programs in Windows and try to uninstall one and sometimes accidentally uninstall the wrong one. And, um, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I've been there too. <laughs> but that was really a long time ago. We got, you know, other computers throughout the years. And one thing that I was always kind of interested in was, um, video games and not only playing them, but, you know, creating them. Uh, I downloaded several programs, only some of which turned out to be Trojan horses, um, which would <laughs> uh, help you create games. And eventually I landed on one called uh, Engine 001 when I was about 10. Um, and that Engine 001, uh, or 001 Game Creator as it's called now, was special you know, it was Windows only program written in Visual Basic .NET. Um and it was special in it gave a flowchart style programming interface, but even more than that, it had a community. 
And I joined that community a long time ago. I will not tell you what my username was. Someone will probably find a way to find it someday, and that I am absolutely terrified about. Um, <laughs> it had a friendly community who, to this 10-year-old kid, who was just a complete idiot, I have gone back and read some of my posts from that era, and oh no. Oh no, <laughs> oh, no. I'm a... Uh, mm, uh, <laughs> was just an amazing place to be and an amazing helpful place to be and i think that 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 community more than the software is kind of what was formative for me in computing um because there were friendly people around to talk to and get help from it was so much better than you know the technology itself because like i said it was a vb.net program it was a little crashy sometimes it um it worked it worked well. Um, it was just a little strange. Uh, but the community that was around it was really what was really uh, special. And I think what convinced me later to go more into like a community uh, angle on software instead of like the more classic um, business development, you know, business, business, business numbers kind of thing. <laughs> Great. Do you still have any of your old projects you've worked on? Yes, I do. I think some of them actually compile with the version that is available today. Um, <laughs> there was one that I was uh, ridiculously proud of. Um, at the time when like neural networks were just becoming popular in computing, I had a small, tiny, tiny, tiny idea of what the heck that actually meant. Um, where an input was biased toward creating a different output and i made a simulator where there were a bunch of arrows on screen and there were a bunch of dots representing food for those arrows the arrows could see in three directions straight in front of them and then off to the left or right side um and randomly assigned based on that information they would uh create an output given that input so if they saw a piece of food to their left randomly they would go forward left or right based on that information um and that was for actually a, a biology project in school that i made that uh the ones that got food got to go on to the next generation and it was kind of a uh evolution through cloning thing where eventually at mm -hmm. some point all or most of those uh arrows on screen would be able to successfully move toward food and take it and only some of them randomly ran off screen hmm. like a neural network i mean that's yeah that's what it was supposed to be i didn't really understand the concepts and i think if i looked back on the code today i would have no idea what it was doing um mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but those were the kinds of projects that i made and i just had fun with them and Whatever happened, happened. And yes, I still have them. That is really cool. That's pretty cool. You said um, that you got then interested in uh, community-based development, helping other people out. And I'm assuming that kind of interest eventually got you interested in Ubuntu Touch. But uh, how did exactly did you get started with participating and becoming the, the, the development manager at, uh, for, for UbiPorts? Oh, boy. So this is kind of a rocky, strange period, because I'm not entirely sure what inspired me to start. And to this day, I still can't figure it out. I think what happened is there was an episode of Linux Action Show, rest in peace, uh, where Noah and Chris were talking about Ubuntu Touch and the BQM10 tablets coming out. Um. Because I think they didn't actually ship in earnest until 2016, even though they should have come out in 2015. See, this is where things get rocky, because I don't entirely understand how this happened. Um, at the time, I had a Nexus 5X in my pocket, which was playing the podcast, and I thought, hmm, I would like Ubuntu Touch on this Nexus 5X smartphone. Uh, at the time, UbiPorts was the project exclusively dedicated to porting Ubuntu for devices to new Android devices, uh, because, well, Canonical was there to make the actual operating system, so UbiPorts only had to do the porting. Um, before UbiPorts was around in, like, uh, 
from the start of the project in or start of Ubuntu Touch in 2012 until around 2014. Uh, there were a lot of efforts to port it to new devices, but most of them were disjointed and just around on XDA from people who managed to figure it out. Uh, what UbiPorts was supposed to be is a community where people could come together and learn how to port Ubuntu for devices, created by Canonical, to devices that Canonical didn't specifically bless. Um, and so it was still in 2016 when I got interested in the project. An alternative theory is, around that time I remember having the Unity... No, that's too late. Yeah, it's just... Ah! At some point I had the Unity 8 development preview on my tablet, uh, and I thought that was pretty cool too. An x86 tablet. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Somehow, anyway, I um, said, this is a Nexus 5X, I want Ubuntu Touch on it, slash join hash UB ports on Freenode. <laughs> um, and... Got to talking with people there. Um, they said, well, we don't really have a way to do ports for Android 6 devices, but you can certainly give it a try. Uh, one thing that was important was they didn't have ways to do ports for ARM64 devices either, which I didn't know what that meant at that point. Um, but that was kind of the important part. Uh, <laughs> I started talking to people there. Uh, the first person who greeted me was uh, Florian, I believe who is still around, is now a director of the UbiPorts Foundation, um, and Lyo, who is around too. Cool guy. Uh, one person who was notably missing at the time was Marius, though. And, you know, I met Marius Quebec, who is editing this right now. Hi, Marius! Uh, <laughs> we'll see if he cuts that out or not. And... You know, we got to talking. He was making a tool for installing Ubuntu Touch on devices and uh, other operating systems, too. And I kind of came together with these people and meshed with a lot of them. Jan was around, too. They are, they're still around. They're very cool. Um, but we kind of got together. We kind of gelled. And um, actually, to this day, there is no way to run Ubuntu Touch on a Nexus 5X. But I'm still around, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> that was around August of 2016. It was really soon after I'd graduated high school. Um, and then in April of, well, in December of 2016, Canonical announced that they were putting the Ubuntu for Devices project on hiatus. And I remember this was a source of uh, <laughs> big drama in small community because. Someone on the internet said, Ubuntu Touch is dead. And we were like, no, it's not dead. Well, four months later, Ubuntu Touch was indeed dead. Uh, <laughs> again, another source of... How, how did you feel that day? It was April 5th. It was April 5th of 2017, and I remember exactly where I was. Um, <laughs> I was sitting in my office at my old high school. I suppose I can't call it my office, um, where I was working at the time. And I had personal telegram on the school computer, which is big no-no, I know, but I did it. And someone uh, <laughs> sent me the link and was like, hey, check this out. Uh, your project just died. <laughs> I said, um, what? At that, I don't remember what the heck I was doing that day, probably just maintaining a couple Windows systems, fixing some issues with big touchscreen boards that go on the wall. But after that, I was doing uh, basically nothing, uh, except sulking. <laughs> we, uh, boy, that was quite a day. I remember at the time, uh, a few of us in the community were like, well, we gotta start porting something else. We gotta port Ubuntu Core to more devices. We need to become the Ubuntu Core porters or something. Um, because that was obviously the way forward. Um, Ubuntu Personal was basically gone at that point, which was a project for an all-snap desktop version of Ubuntu, which hasn't come to fruition yet. Um, as was basically the Ubuntu for Devices project. Um, a couple days later, Mario Scripps Guard came around and said, Nah, we're maintaining Ubuntu Touch now. And we said, Excuse me, what? Uh, there's no way that we could do that. 
Uh, but we did. Here we are five years later, and we managed not only to maintain it, but to start creating new things with it. To ship new devices with Ubuntu Touch, and actually build a little community around ourselves. I say little community, it's actually pretty huge at this point um <laughs> yeah. you've got a foundation you're established now. yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We've, we have a name for ourselves we're tax deductible in several places in europe yeah uh, <laughs> in germany i i use that <laughs> <laughs> whenever i get the chance to so then uh unless you want to continue on how that ubiport's success story went on um how and when did you first hear about Pine64 or the Pine phone? How do, when did I hear about Pine64? Well, there were rumblings in the community about um, this uh, Pine book thing, this you know $100 laptop that you could get if you uh, put your name in on a pre-order list and waited a year. Um, <laughs> I didn't have one, but it sounded very interesting to me. Uh and, you know, I followed from a distance, because I had no real need for an ARM64 device. At the time, we were mainly shipping on ARMHF devices, and someone had given us, and they still sponsor, this giant build server that we just use for things anyway. So, you know, beyond a Raspberry Pi, which I didn't own, in, I didn't own one until last year, actually, um, hmm. I really had no need for uh, an ARM computer. Fast forward to, oh, geez, I could find the exact day for you if you wanted to wait, but I won't make you. Um, sometime in 2018, late 2018, early 2019, um, when Lucas Lu Lu came into the Ubiport's main telegram group, which was about 2,000 people at the time, and said, Hi, I'm from Pine64. We're thinking about making a smartphone. Uh, <laughs> and that was the first I had ever heard of the Pine64 Pine phone. Uh, <laughs> and that would become a relationship that has lasted until, well, February, uh, when is this supposed to come out? Then 2021. Wow. Yeah. It was kind of an, uh, amazing serendipitous <laughs> occasion, because, like, did, did they just announce a smartphone in our group with 2,000 people in it? That seems like an interesting way to start, because at the time, we'd been working with some projects which, you know, were very quiet about what they were doing. They are very cautious to announce anything publicly until it was um, done with PR, and um, they had checked it over and everything. And, you know, here comes, <laughs> here comes Little Pine 64 along saying, hey, we're going to do this now. We don't know how, but we're going to do it. <laughs> A few months later, they shipped me the... Uh, don't be evil prototype. No, wait, Anakin f came first. The Anakin prototype, yeah. which was this giant uh, seven-inch tablet thing in the Pine64 play box enclosure uh, with a little <laughs> USB modem. Uh, we got Unity 8 running on that uh, using a not quite Ubuntu touch solution, but it was ready in time for FOSDEM, which was all that really mattered. Uh, we showed it on the FOSDEM floor, uh, with a Pine64 Air Mouse, uh, which, you know, t TL, TL, I love you. The Air Mouse is kind of a pain to use. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we were trying to show off the features of Unity, now called Lomiri, on the floor with this Air Mouse, <laughs> and trying to point it around, trying to, like, Wii Remote waggle this thing all over the place, like, ah! <laughs> because touch didn't work at the time. Um, but that was our first prototype. <laughs> A few months later, they sent out the actual Don't Be Evil prototypes, which looked a little bit more like a phone. Um, you snapped a Sopine into the rear of the device, and uh, it was kind of a phone. It kind of wasn't. Uh, it had a EC25 modem, which went into a micro uh, mini PCI Express slot, which was actually doing USB. Yeah. Uh, we found a bug with it, where... <laughs> He actually needed to send out little uh, daughter board carriers for the SIM card because the original uh, SIM card slot was wired incorrectly on the device. Uh, it was just an interesting project uh, for reasons like that. 
When we actually got to Braveheart, though, that was uh, pretty big. Uh, we didn't ship. It didn't ship with an OS. It shipped with uh, Martine's excellent test program. Uh, and at that point, we had images kind of ready. They were still read write. They weren't really Ubuntu Touch. You had to like jump through a bunch of hoops to get the apps working or anything. But mm-hmm. it was a start. Yeah, and then you got the first community edition. We did become the first community edition in 2020, I think. Oh, no, time is getting weird. Um, (laughs) When we announced that we were the first community edition, it was, uh, you could say, kind of a big deal because, you know, people wouldn't only be ordering it to test Ubuntu Touch. You know, as much as I do love Ubuntu Touch, I understand the Vine64 community and did then, too. Um there were going to be a lot of people ordering this. We'd be on a lot of devices. And um, we needed the factory image out about a month before it shipped. So we pull, I think I pulled a week of all-nighters along with Marius to get that thing in shape and get the OTA upgrades working and everything uh, before it shipped. Uh, Which was um, fun. It was an experience. Yeah. We'll say it like that. Yeah. Uh, where we, it's like we we just got to do it. There's there's nothing else we can do. We we got to get it done. Um. It turned out the factory delayed by about a week, so we had an extra week <laughs> to make the images that we expected. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, that's that's always great. <sighs> and you're a little bit more ready than. Uh, yeah, you put some extra time, right? But but uh, I mean, a week of all night is that's really. Uh, I couldn't do that anymore. But uh, I mean, that was an experience, not one that I want to repeat. But it was an experience. And how has it gone since then? Uh, for you, what's what? How? What do you think about the progress of uh, Ubuntu Touch on the Pine Phone sense? Okay, Ubuntu Touch on the Pine Phone. We always. So, I'll back up a step. How Ubuntu Touch is usually shipped is on Android devices using a system called Hybris to run Android drivers uh, directly in a Linux use- or a GNU slash Linux user space. And we run an Android container to run things like the Android radio interface layer and other similar services. Um, directly on the hardware, well, in a container, so that we have access to the Android uh, proprietary drivers on Android devices. And that's how we ship Ubuntu Touch um, with those binary drivers. It makes it easier than um, trying to reverse engineer all the hardware in a phone. That presented a problem when we came to the Pine64 Pine phone. Because the Pine phone has, well, no useful Android um, to speak of. No one ever made one. Um, and the A64 drivers on Android leave a lot to be desired anyway. So we essentially needed to re-architect Ubuntu Touch to run no longer on this system where Android provides things like how we boot the device. It provides the bootloader uh, up to the kernel. Um, how we build boot images so that we can actually boot uh, the kernel with an init RAM FS. Um, all things that we just don't need to consider. How to turn on, how to turn on the phone radio. Uh, things that we generally don't need to consider when we're shipping on Android devices all became uh, distinctly our problem. So there was a small re-architecture of how we built Ubuntu Touch for the device. And um, to this day, you can still see where... You can see where the cracks show, you know? Um, The A64, we can't run um, mere client applications on it. So uh, things like our online account subsystem are out of the picture because they don't work with Wayland quite yet. 
And there's just other behavioral differences between the Android and the Ubuntu Touch, or the PinePhone port of Ubuntu Touch. If we could just start over with Ubuntu Touch, you know, at this point, you know, a couple years after the PinePhone's been around, um, if we were starting over from scratch, if we didn't have any of the hybrid stuff, um, I certainly wouldn't encourage us to <laughs> recreate all the hybrid stuff, that's for sure. But the thing is that we have a lot of users on Android devices, so we kind of need to keep maintaining both things. Um, the mainline stuff for the Pine phone and the Pine tab and whatever else we decide to sh ship. Um, and the Android stuff for newer devices coming out on the, our Android side. It's an uh, interesting duality. Uh, it's taught us a lot about technical debt. It's taught us a lot about um, assumptions that you make during development. Um, so it's been an excellent learning experience. And I think ultimately what I want to say is uh, Ubuntu Touch on the Pine phone is still weird <laughs> compared to everything else. And I'm 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 slowly trying to fix that. Um uh, we're working on a kernel upgrade which brings a lot of new hardware compatibility. Um and we're trying to do things right by mainline Linux. Um meaning we're trying to use the upstream uh interfaces for things. We're trying to um link Mesa correctly into our software so that it doesn't explode sometimes. Uh, it's just a slow process when we're maintaining both mainline and Android-style Ubuntu Touch, and uh, something that we are constantly improving on. Besides that, I know that you've got lots of plans for uh, 2021 with uh, Qt 5.12 uh, coming in and with going to Ubuntu 2004 as a base. So... Um, if someone's listening and is like, oh, I want to have that project, uh, how can they help you generally and how can they help you to th thrive on the Pine phone? Uh, there's, I mean, there's infinite numbers of ways to contribute to Ubuntu Touch. If you're just someone who, you know, you speak English and another language, um, the easiest way to get involved is to help us translate. docs.ubports.com. Uh, there's a contribute section where you can learn about how to translate Ubuntu Touch. Um, we have other ways to contribute, including just regular development. We're now working on bringing the Lomiri, uh, UI and application stacks to, uh, Manjaro. And we have a couple of people working on Manjaro, uh, with the Lomiri stack, which makes it easier for them to develop on it, easier for them to find bugs, which are then all the patches that they're submitting, uh, from the Manjaro side, are going to trickle down to Ubuntu Touch 2004, because a lot of the stuff that's in Manjaro that isn't in Ubuntu 16.04, which Ubuntu Touch is based on now, um, it's going to be in 2004 when we move on to that. Uh, so there's developing on that side. If you want to develop specifically on the Pine phone, uh, we've got guides for how to build software, or you can just get in touch with me. I'm at Universal Superbox on Telegram. If you do PM me, though, tell me what you want, like, in the first message, um, because there's a lot of spam on Telegram, so I'm a little paranoid. Um, <laughs> hey, I've got Bitcoin for you. <laughs> don't say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've also got our Pine64 uh, group, our Ubuntu Touch on Pine group, which I am looking up the address for as i say this sentence it is at u at ut on pine got it before i finish the sentence um that's a great place to join just say what you're interested in um you know a lot of successful contributions a lot of successful first contributions or lasting contributions from people come from they're holding the phone in their hand and they say my god this is annoying and uh <laughs> we'll help them fix that out <laughs> fix that up and not be annoying to them anymore. That's been some of the most successful contributions we've got. Uh, everything from keyboards for uh, different languages being built into the operating system to yeah. um, having a button that says screenshot when you hold the power button down. 
so you can take a screenshot. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. So thank you for your time. Oh, yeah, no worries. And uh, I think this was a good first interview for us because you were amazing as a p- partner in interviewing because you just talked and talked and it <laughs> stayed on the topic <laughs> meanwhile mm-hmm. which is something that i frequently fail at so awesome all right well uh thank you very much for having me dalton what a wonderful guy wouldn't you agree totally this was fun in in other news we got some pine 64 community news such as the end of the community editions What do you think about that? There have been uh, five community editions, UB ports, mm-hmm. PostMarket OS, Manjaro, KDE, and now for the last one, Mopian. And mm-hmm. I think at, at some point it hard, it's hard to go on with that, right? I mean, there's still some distributions where one could have been, could have been going for a community edition, but Honestly, they're getting fewer and fewer. And mm-hmm. so I think it's a good step for the uh, PinePhone uh, to move on from this stage and um, go, well, we don't really know where it will go, do we? But um, it's we can inform you. That's uh, what, <laughs> what we've been told, that it's going to be available again and it's going to be well, the good old pine phone you know and love, and mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be available at the same prices. So yeah, it's it's an end of one era, but the beginning of a new. Exactly. Yeah, and I think it was a. Uh, I like the, uh, the the whole idea behind um, the community editions. I think it was really, it was really cool. That they decided to do that, and I think it it helped uh, all the communities a bit, you know, to 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 know about the Pine Phone and to know about uh, mobile Linux operating systems. Yeah, um, I I wouldn't have known a, about PostMarket OS if it wasn't about if it wasn't for Pine Phone. <laughs> What have and you been doing? I, <laughs> But yeah, I know, sure. right? Many, I think many people. <laughs> feel the same and uh it's mm-hmm. certainly helping those projects in a way to get some new stories uh become more known within the linux community and also the funding aspect right uh ten dollars mm-hmm. of review of these community edition pine funds went to those projects and um i think postmark os even set up their whole donation infrastructure which just for that uh, they hadn't figured that out before And they did it then uh, for the community edition. And it's going to help those projects long term to have a fund of a pool of money uh, to fund their infrastructure from. Yeah, so definitely. Definitely. That's really a nice contribution. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy they did it. Uh, but uh, I'm also excited to see uh, what comes next. Yeah. What is going to be the production OS? Mm. Or are they going back to like with the Braveheart edition and <laughs> nothing pre-installed? <laughs> But I, I, I really mm. doubt that. I'm very mm. sure that's not the case. So time will tell. Yeah, we've got another topic in this community news section, and that is um, a pine phone, pine phone firmware news, because that mm-hmm. thing has been opened a bit. That Cracktel EG 25G modem. So um, you can use it now in theory with less blobs. Um, we've linked that story. Uh, I don't think. Uh, have you tried that yet? I have not. Yeah, me neither. So <laughs> we'll let you be brave, maybe, or uh, just um, wait a bit until um, people report success on this because i'm certainly going to try it at some point in the future but it's great to see development definitely. going on there and that's it. it it definitely reminds me of uh you know good old 
good old FOSS mentality of, of trying to make everything open source, even if it's not. Yeah. Yeah, just open the last bit of the system that's there. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, a little bit of cleanup. That's awesome. And uh, we we really should work on uh, including more news on other Pine64 products and mm. uh, the next yeah. uh, one, uh, next episode. And we will do that for sure. But Let's get to another section that only has PinePhone products again, because we are <laughs> we figured that we could talk about new products because there have been a few, and one of them is the PinePhone Flex Breakout Board, which is um, basically for those pogo pins. So if mm. you uh, saw those videos about the thermal camera and want to do that too, or you've got some other products uh, project projects to hack on or something like this might be helpful this is something you can do now and uh, then there's the micro sd extender i think that's mainly interesting if you've got a custom case or something uh, which mm -hmm. makes it hard to open the phone maybe that maybe it's a preparation for that keyboard case so that's definitely <laughs> interesting yeah. too but now let's get uh, to the important part Uh, to, to the most important part, the community part. And that is your feedback and questions. So we got a lot of feedback and most of it was very kind and nice and we thank you for that. And we just picked a few things that we figured we might discuss in this here. So Orlai here asks us, I want to hear what you think about the future of Linux phones. Big companies have tried to make Linux phones, including the Ubuntu, fail, and not one has been a success. So my question is this, do you think that Pine and the competitor that shall not be named can succeed where the big companies failed? Do you think that the Pine phones will be a finged device, or is it just a start of something big? I think it's a bit of, of both because we all, everything has to start somewhere. And a lot of these first, like Linux phone products won't be perfect because we're, we still got some things to figure out. But one thing's for sure. I think just like Linux on desktop, there will always be some form of Linux on mobile. There will always be someone who wants that. And It really depends, I think, on how much interest people have in such a device that will kind of affect how good it is in the end, maybe. Because it takes a lot of time and investment, and obviously if nobody wants a Linux phone, there won't be a Linux phone. But I don't think nobody wants a Linux phone. I think a large amount of people want a Linux phone. I don't think the Pine phone is necessarily a Finge device either. I think it's it's a very interesting device for being inexpensive, older hardware that can run a lot of different things and will continue to run a lot of different things as the software improves. What do you think? Well, I, uh, I'm mostly on the same page, I think. Uh, Being someone who has a diploma in business administration, I think that uh, it depends what you call a failure here. Um, Ubuntu uh, has, well, maybe they've not reached the goals they wanted to, um, but it felt to me that they uh, stopped making phones because they shifted the whole company in a different direction. So mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say that that's a failed product. Also, we just talked to Dalton, and Ubuntu Touch is still going strong in a way. It's no more maintained by Canonical, but um, it's still being developed and very actively. And I think 2021 is going to be a great year for them. Now, if you're we're thinking that, okay, maybe uh, Linux phones will make uh, a clear third player uh, next to Android and iOS. Well, 
maybe, but it's going to be a very small <laughs> player. Um, maybe we can eventually beat uh, stuff like Kai OS, that uh, Firefox OS offspring. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, it's going to be a niche, uh, a niche, and I think that's perfectly fine, um, as long as there are pro- projects and companies that keep making the hardware available and developing that hardware a bit, so that uh, community operating systems can advance along. I think we're fine. And I personally have to say that I don't really care about uh, mobile Linux replacing Android or iOS uh, globally. I really care about that we will have this niche and that this niche is sustainable for companies like Pine64 or maybe Purism to name uh, the device that shall not be named. Um <laughs> That's that's really all I personally care about. I don't really think that uh, we need to have uh, billions of devices running mobile Linux out there. Mm-hmm. And I don't even think that that would be necessarily a good thing because with that comes a lot of business logic that would then eventually make it into those platforms, uh, leading to the same uh, problems with data privacy and so on, likely, as we've seen on Android and iOS. And mm-hmm. honestly, I'm rather in that niche, in the fringe niche, maybe even uh, than having that. I think, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Thank you very much for that question, Orly. Next up, we have another email, which reads, How do you think NVIDIA purchasing ARM will impact Pine? Do you think or know if Pine will make Risk Five products? Personally, I'd like to see Pine focus on RISC-V devices, as that is the future. I know that Pine already has RISC-V devices, such as the, the Pine Soul. Yeah. And I'm sure there's plenty of, of, of RISC-V projects they'll have in the future. I also personally think uh, RISC-V is... a uh, well, it's a future. It's a big future, and I think we'll be will become more and more part of uh, uh, embedded systems uh, as it already has uh, shown. So I, I definitely think that there's going to be some some good uses to 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 Risk Five over uh, just a a, a pencil uh, or a pencil. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I don't think NVIDIA purchasing ARM will necessarily impact Pine because they're using older ARM processors, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, I mean, perhaps it changes. Like, I'm not exactly in the know of, of the whole dealio, but, uh, you know, aside from who you're paying the rights to and how much those rights cost, I can't imagine using ARM products, like older ARM products, it would change anything in the pine world but i don't know what about you peter do you know yeah i think nvidia better not screw up the whole uh, successful arm ecosystem so mm-hmm. if i were nvidia i would change next to nothing about what how arm is doing this licensing and stuff um they could try to maybe get their gpus into the arm space more and quit developing mm-hmm. the Mali products. But then again, I don't think that would be a very good idea either. But um, really, I, I just hope that NVIDIA will just keep ARM running as they are because they've done a great job if you look at the success of ARM in the past decade. Um, mm-hmm. I see no reason to make radical changes there. And if so, um, given current... Um, Current Pine sixty four project products with ARM CPUs likely wouldn't be affected anyway. Now, Risk Five is definitely interesting. I uh, have one Risk Five device here. It's the Pine Cell, <laughs> but uh, I haven't actually even used that for soldering purposes, so I can't say anything about that. I'm yet to use a Risk Five product. 
I've read a uh, plenty enthusiasm about risk five and then some people that were trying to tone it down a bit and were like yeah but the art architecture is pretty undefined and it has some problems in the foundations and this is not what's going to take over the world um well we'll see i think um for now it certainly looks like risk five is progressing Mm -hmm. And uh, if that architecture ends up being well-defined enough or subsets of that architecture are common enough so that you can get Linux to run well on this and uh, have it run on not only one device but multiples, um, that might definitely work out. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, of course, still of uh, still a lot of bringing up to do. You won't have as many uh, distros that support it for now. Um, you may have less packages even in the distributions that support it and so on. But generally, it's a great thing to see this happen, to have a more open architecture um, that's not open power, which is likely not for uh, the the power envelopes we would need for smart smartphones or something. So uh, RISC-5 is definitely one to watch, and I'm pretty sure that pine 64 is going to uh come out with some new products in that field because that's what pine 64 do right <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah lastly we've gotten a lot of feedback on better show notes that should include links on topics we talked about we've got suggestions for directories the podcast should be listed in and so on we appreciate this, and we hope to do better with this episode. The podcast is in progress of being listed in all the directories you su suggested. Unfortunately, it's really hard to get it done with some directories, which is why we can't report full success yet. This episode also features chapter markers, a feature that allows you to skip topics you are not that interested in. This is something we could achieve by getting professional help with the production of the podcast. Thank you to Nerds and Media for being our audio producers. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Remember, this is a community podcast, so leave feedback on what we should do better, get your suggestions in, and feel free to ask questions. You can join the Discord channel, Pine Talk Podcast, on Pine64's Discord. You can send us email at pinetalk at pine64.org and tweet us at at talkpine. Yeah, that's it. And thank you for listening. And we look forward to you listening in again in two weeks. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.